Good morning. Nice to be back with you again. Please open your Bibles to Habakkuk chapter 1. I'm going to pick up where I left off last week at verse 12. Habakkuk chapter 1. Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk. Just count back five from Matthew. You'll be there. Um, It's providential that we've had these readings today, actually. Um, The psalm, I think, really picks up the tone of what Habakkuk might be feeling himself in the reading that we have today. And actually what Jesus has communicated to his disciples really represents so much of what I want to capture for application for us today. The closing words that Jesus said there, I've said these things um, so that in me you may have peace. In the world you'll have tribulation, but take heart, I've overcome the world. There is something that reminds us about who we are as God's people and gives us an ultimate perspective even whilst we have temporary sufferings now. And that's what we're going to be engaging with today in Habakkuk. So let me pray. Father, please help me as I speak to do so clearly and faithfully and as we listen to do so with um, keen ears and open hearts, Lord. Work Work your word into our lives by your spirit, helping us to take heart in a world which seems so opposed to us. And when we can't see or reason why certain things are happening, may we operate by faith. May we continue to trust you no matter what. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The question really is, why is it that the wicked seem to prosper? This is not a question that's foreign to the Bible. You can find it at many different times. But why is it that the wicked seem to prosper? I teach ethics here at college. Many of you are in my ethics class present in this room right now. Glad you stuck around for this hour after last hour. Um, What I try to do there, for those of you that haven't had me yet, is that I want to show you that God's ways are actually good for us as we live in His world. But so much of what I teach is based on what is promised rather than what is known or seen immediately. For example, I tell people that God calls us to an honest way of living because this accords with who God is as true. He is true. There's no deception in God, and therefore, as His people, we should be true. But the trouble is that this honesty is not always beneficial to us in the immediate term. There are many who will use a strictly honest policy in us to bring others down through their own deception and manipulation, they'll construct stories that aren't true, but are beneficial. I've said telling the truth is right, but I haven't said that telling the truth is always advantageous. A very silly anecdote from me is that I remember at uni, uh, one of my lecturers said, "Um, I want you to just give yourself a mark for how you think you've performed in this class this semester. You give yourself an honest mark And that will factor into your final mark. And I thought, oh, I didn't really care as much as I could have for this class. I probably should have done a little bit more reading, studying. Mm, I'll give myself like a B. Um, Well, some mates of mine who were class clowns, I mean, absolutely put zero effort into the class. They thought, this is a free ride. A plus, definitely A plus. And what happened at the end? The guy didn't give any consideration to anything other than what we wrote down for ourselves. What did I get for the class? A B. Here I thought he's going to think, oh, this guy's being honest. Let's bump him up a bit. He obviously performed a little bit better than that. No, he just gave me the B. And these jokers that did nothing, what do they get? A plus. I couldn't believe it. I assumed doing the right thing was going to pay rewards, but it didn't. Now, for many of us, as silly as that anecdote was, for many of us, as we look around at life, we will cry foul against God when we see others prosper, especially in their open denial of what God says is good. How, Lord? How can they keep getting a a leg up? Why? Why, if we are listening to your word, are they overcoming us? This is the problem that Habakkuk brought before the Lord in his second complaint in his prophecy. Last week, we saw him asking the Lord, How long, Lord, will I have to look upon iniquity? And why is it, Lord, 
that you let it carry on without justice. And the Lord told Habakkuk, Oh, Habakkuk, just open your eyes and see something, things that you couldn't even believe if I told you. I'm raising up the Babylonians, those Chaldeans. They're going to come, and they're going to bring justice. Well, now Habakkuk, having received that message, has a different question. Really? Them? Will you allow the idolatrous to prevail? So let's look at this passage and see a bit more. We'll begin looking, first of all, at an honest complaint to the Lord. Look with me down here at chapter 1, verses 12 to 17. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you've ordained them as judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong. Why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. He brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet, so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his dragnet. For by them, he lives in luxury and his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? Habakkuk begins his complaint First of all, by recognizing the character of the Lord. He starts by taking notice that God is everlasting and holy. And this provides him with some reassurance, actually. In the midst of all of this, even in the midst of this promised conquest that's going to bring justice, we will not die. Who the Lord is gives some guarantee that the promises that have come will continue to stand. And so Habakkuk appropriately recognizes that God's sovereignty and his right to use whomever he wishes for the, tr- for the rebuke and judgment against his people. Notice again, last week Habakkuk asked for justice, and here he's being, it's being given again as the Lord is reprimanding his people by this foreign nation. This judgment is actually the justice that God has pleaded Uh, Sorry, that Habakkuk has pleaded to the Lord for. And yet there's a problem for Habakkuk in his mind. How can the God who is so pure, unable to look upon evil, how can he allow this kind of evil nation to prevail over his people, the righteous ones? Now, Habakkuk is upholding God's people as righteous not because of how they've been behaving, but actually because of their election. They are the people whom God chose. Now, how can those not chosen by God triumph over the Lord's people? Well, Habakkuk gives us a bit of a richer picture of this concern in verses 14 to 17. He says that all of humanity really has been made to be like fish. God is allowing humanity to be treated less than human. The Babylonians are like ruthless fishermen. They're capturing these fish, either by hook or net. And they're rejoicing over their dominance, gathering more and more spoils as they go, becoming prouder and richer and prouder and prouder. But here's the problem. When they are victorious, they sacrifice to these instruments They sacrifice to the very nets that are capturing up the people. They become idolatrous in the process. And this is just like what we saw last week in verse 11, that their own might is their God. So in verse 16, Habakkuk seems to be taking things a step further, recognizing these pagans, with no regard for God, are being allowed glory even seemingly at the expense of God. Will the Lord allow them to continue mercilessly? Well, I mentioned that Habakkuk was never rebuked for these things. I said that last week, and I want to see it again. He's not rebuked for asking this question, because notice how even now he does so through the eyes of faith. His declaration in the beginning 
is one of God's character. And this provides the basis for his own confusion. God, if you were like this, and I believe it, well then how can this be? And notice the final line in this section, verse 17. He recognizes God's sovereignty over the whole affair and questions why God who is merciful, Lord, you've revealed yourself to be merciful. How can you let this people go on mercilessly? God is in control. How can this merciless action carry on? There's many times and instances in our lives where we, as people of faith, wrestle with the things that we believe when they don't agree with our experience. Lord, you've told me these things are true. Lord, you've told me you are like this, but this is where I'm at. Why? How can it be? Lord, I've sought to be faithful. How can these wicked employers take advantage of me? Lord, why, when I've been continuously honest and sought to live with integrity, have you allowed these people to defame me and speak lies against me? When these tensions arise for us, the faithful work from faith through experience. When these tensions arise, the faithful will work from faith through their experience. So even in these moments of confusion, it's their faith which drives the questions appealing to the character and promises of God. And Habakkuk gives it a rest at this point. He's asked his question, he's laid his case again before the Lord, and now he waits silently. In fact, he resumes his position as the prophet watching up on the watchtower. But interestingly, it seems as though when he would normally be watching after the leadership and the people, are they keeping the word of the Lord? He's now watching to see, will God keep his word? And the Lord responds. And this is our second point. There's a vision for the future that the Lord gives. The Lord responds in verse 2, like his first response, not for a private word to Habakkuk, but for all to hear. Look with me at verse 2 of chapter 2. The Lord answered me, write the vision. Make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It's not upright within him. But the righteous shall live by his faith. Moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who is never at rest. His greed is as wide as Sheol. Like death, he has never enough. He gathers for himself all nations and collects as his own all peoples. The Lord here is giving a Habakkuk, giving Habakkuk a vision to write down. In fact, he says, write it down on tablets. And immediately our mind goes back to the giving of the law. What this is being given now is actually a, an eschatological vision. It's something for the appointed time. Sure, there's a word for Babylon now, but actually this is the kind of thing where there is a word for Babylon and the whole, the, all the people that would rise up against God's people. The kind of thing that John picks up in his revelation as he condemns that whorish people of Babylon. Well, Habakkuk writes these things on tablets And perhaps this is why many in the Jewish tradition say that whilst there were 613 commands, Habakkuk distills it down to one. And the vision's captured for us in verses 4 and 5. It's a contrast between the proud, who are not upright, that is, they are not righteous, and the righteous. The proud is unrighteous because he trusts in himself. He's led by his ambition. He's intoxicated with his power and his greed. He's a bottomless pit like death. He never has enough. The righteous, by contrast, doesn't live by his own power, but by his faith. And here we're going to slow down for just a moment because this passage is so crucial for, the, for Habakkuk's prophecy. And it's so crucial for so much of what develops in the New Testament later. 
The righteous shall live by his faith. The word from God to Habakkuk is said by one commentator to be this. Instead of stating explicitly that the justified by faith shall live, the phrase asserts that the justified shall live by faith. Listen to that again. What Habakkuk does not say is that the justified by faith shall live, but actually that the justified shall live by faith. Here, the righteous one continues in life just as he's received life by faith. So there's some intentional parallels here in this section, I think, between um, what Habakkuk is experiencing and what Abraham knew in his experience, that initial point where we learned about righteousness coming by faith. The Lord is continuing to show people that his people are those that believe him, that trust him. So when Abram knew the promise of the Lord, he struggled to see how the promise would come to pass. Listen to Genesis 15 for a moment. You don't need to turn there, just listen. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I'm your shield. Your reward shall be great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you've given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him. Oh, this man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look towards the heavens. Number the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to them, said to him, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. Abram was called righteous because he believed God. But he had to continue in this belief because it wasn't a quick fix for Abram. He had to wait into age and age and age years where things seemed beyond beyond possible. They were absolutely impossible for him to conceive, would he keep on trusting the Lord? Not only that, but once he had the son and the Lord said, go sacrifice him, would he keep on trusting the Lord? As it was for Abram, so it was for Habakkuk. Lord, you've promised this people will always be yours, but how will this be so when the Babylonians will completely wipe us out? Trust me, says the Lord. What about the Apostle Paul, likewise reflecting on these things? The Israelites, they're not responding to the gospel. But the Lord is bringing in the nations. Someday then, Israel will be brought round to salvation. Oh, how mysterious, how glorious are your plans and purposes, Lord. So it is with us. Lord, why is it that we feel like we are declining in number? Why does it feel like the world is overcoming us? You promised to build your kingdom. You said that the gates of hell would not prevail against your church. Dear Christian, remember today, the righteous shall live by their faith. One of the most helpful reminders in this section comes to us in verse 3, actually. I skipped over it a moment ago. But the Lord tells us that this vision is sure. But it's waiting for the appropriate time. The vision's hastening towards the end, so it's going quickly, and yet it seems slow. And so Calvin gives us some perspective. He says, actually, the human perspective feels like the Lord is tarrying. He's taking his sweet time. Maybe he's held up somehow. But actually, the Lord's perspective is no. Everything is happening according to plan. We're called to trust him by faith, even when the Lord's promises seem slow to come to us. Christ, where is your coming? You've said you will come for us. Are you really coming? Wait for me. Wait watchfully. In fact, a day for me is like a thousand years to you. And a thousand years to me is like a day to you. Trust me. 
This brings us to our final point this morning. Having heard a word for believers, the Lord delivers a word of woe to Babylon. In fact, he gives five woes down to the end, beginning in verse 6 all the way down to the end of verse 20. Five woes to Babylon. Now, in the interest of time, I'm not going to read all of this, but I will summarize to you how these woes work and give you the gist of what they're saying and try to capture why I think they're kept for us here. What I love about these woes is that they are warnings to Babylon, but actually they're mockery. They're taunts. If you look up the word woe, um, it's actually just ha. Now, that's not actually how you pronounce it, but that's what it means. Ha! He's laughing at them. He's laughing at this nation that seems unstoppable. This people that just scoops up the whole world in their nets and brags about it and goes on and on and on and on in their power. And the Lord says, five times, woe. First thing, woe. Woe to the ones who take what isn't theirs. You've plundered all kinds of nations, verses 6 to 8 if you want to read along. You've plundered all these nations, but guess what's going to happen? All of their remnant are going to rise up against you. You've made so many enemies, just wait to see what happens to those little bits left behind. Whoa, second thing in verses 9 to 11. Woe to the one who uses evil means. You think you're safe, but actually the very things that you've sought safety in are going to be your undoing. Third woe, verses 12 to 14. Woe to the one who uses violence. Interestingly, violence was the problem Habakkuk had in chapter 1. Violence is the answer that Babylon brings. And now, woe to you for the violence you've had, you bloodthirsty people. Woe to you. And in fact, there's an interruption here in this passage where there's a big shift to the grand perspective. Look down at verse 13. Behold, is it not... Uh, Behold, is it not from the Lord of hosts that peoples labor merely for fire and nations weary themselves for nothing? Verse 14, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. It's a striking contrast. This people is just marching on and on and on and on and on across the globe, thinking we are unstoppable. But there's actually a bigger picture. There's only one thing that's unstoppable. The glory of the the Lord will cover the earth like the sea. It will blanket the whole world, and all peoples will know who he is. Fourth, woe. Woe to the one who is perverse. In fact, you go around intoxicating these nations to uncover their nakedness, says Habakkuk. Well, says the Lord through Habakkuk. You're going around exposing their nudity, but actually, just wait. This kind of perverse action is going to be your shame. The kind of shameful activity you're doing upon them is going to come back upon you. You'll be exposed in your nakedness. You'll be exposed in your uncircumcision. The Lord is going to turn your glory to shame. And fifth, in an interesting change, he doesn't begin with the woe. He begins with an explanation that leads into the woe. Look at verse 18. What profits an idol when its maker has shaped it? A metal image, a teacher of lies. Its maker trusts in its own creation when he makes speechless idols. Woe to him who says to a wooden thing, awake, to a silent stone, arise. Can this teach? Behold, it's overlaid with gold and silver. There's no breath in it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. What are we to make of all these woes? These serve as, for us, ultimate perspective. In the midst of this bombardment of life trials, of everyone rising up against God's people, even by God's ordaining, the Lord offers perspective. Habakkuk is asking, really, will the idolatrous, those proud, arrogant, wicked hearts, will they prevail over your people? The Lord says, I have a vision for the future an ultimate perspective that you have to wait for. I will be glorified throughout the whole earth. This pagan nation will ultimately face justice themselves. There's no question who the sovereign is. So will the idolatrous prevail? 
No, the Lord alone reigns and will be glorified. So we wait for him and for the ultimate justice he will bring at the appointed time. Now for us, we need to hear this. Things do not always go our way. And in fact, we will struggle to marry what we believe with what we experience. And the Lord here gives us perspective about life. And he says, I have a word for the appointed time still. When all things will be made right. It was a word that Christ himself could commit himself to. He modeled the ultimate trust in the plans and the purposes of God. So much so that the righteous one lived by faith unto death. And this is the faith that we've been called to live by, even if it means our death, for surely in living by this faith we'll find life. Listen to what the author to the Hebrews says as an encouragement, picking up on this very verse from, from Habakkuk 2.4, the righteous shall live by his faith. And this will be our conclusion for today. Therefore, don't throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what's promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and, persevere, uh, and preserve their souls. So please... Hear the word of the Lord today. The righteous shall live by faith. Amen.